Okay, we are official. So um, I think it's probably close enough to 605. So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, and again, I am recording the meeting, so we'll add that to the website. My name is Jennifer Dyke. I am the uh, stormwater management program assistant director in the transportation and public works department. So uh, there's several, um, several city staff members here. I do want to introduce uh, council member Hill. Um, who's on the call as well as district director, uh, Sammy Roop. And we've got Jessica McAkron and she is assistant city manager. We've got Lauren Prier, who is the TPW director. Um, we've got a lot of city staff on the call. So I'm really just going to introduce them if I get them to help me with questions. Um, and you'll have a chance to ask questions throughout the meeting um, or after the meeting. So you can use the chat functions like the little raise the hand at the bottom of the slide that you see in this little chat function. And Stephen Nichols, our stormwater program manager, will be helping monitor the chat. So, um, so if you stick something in there, he might wait because he might think, well, I, I, he knows the questions and he, he might wait because we might cover it on another slide um, or at the end of the meeting, depending on what the question is. So, uh, but definitely you won't be forgotten about. Um, so let's see, Council Member Hill, do you wanna say anything before we start? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you all for taking the time. Um, I know it's after hours and I appreciate uh, not only the Fort Worth um, staff's time, but also the community members. We, I know we all been through this process several times now and hopefully this is the last. Um, I do think, um, you know, we're selling the properties individually. We're going to get a different type of response, um, really help maintain the, air, the area, the architectural integrity of Arlington Heights. And I'm really looking forward to being part of this process really from start to finish. So, again, thank you all for being here and I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to hearing the feedback. Thank you. Jessica McAkron, do you want to say anything? Yes, thank you all so much again, as well as uh, Councilman Hill said for taking the time to join our call. Also want to say thank you to so many of you who took the time to reach out over the last many months or years, um, just to share your thoughts and opinions or concerns with us. We really appreciate y'all being engaged in this process and truly caring so much about your community that you're taking the time to stay engaged. And then also thank you to our stormwater staff. I know y'all have been working on this for um, several years and this has been a very large undertaking and a lot of work has gone into this and I am extremely appreciative of all that you've done um, to keep this moving forward and to keep the neighborhood informed. So thank you all. Thanks, Jess. Okay, so let's go ahead um, and kick off. So uh, this is a pretty short presentation, just around 20 slides, but I'm um, going to give a very brief background, really kind of focus on what we've been doing since the last public meeting around the same time last year. Um, for reference, we have our last two public meeting PowerPoint presentations and recordings on the website. So all of that background information is there. So I really just kind of want to touch on what we've been doing for the last year. Um, and then we'll talk about our redevelopment next steps and schedule and then uh, follow up with any remaining questions and discussion. <clears throat> so our last community meeting uh, was May 2023. And so at that time, we rolled out the notice of sale, really going through the key uh, requirements and timelines. Um, and then that notice of sale was then issued um, in August uh, 2023. And we had a virtual pre-proposal meeting for developers that were potentially interested in bidding um, on the property. So we had that in September. We followed up then with two um, two half day back to back due diligence site visits. Um, so we had a pretty good turnout from some developers that were potentially interested in bidding that attended that site visit, uh, walked through the properties. And then our notice of sale closed uh, de December 7th. Uh, so when it closed, we received just one bid. Um, and because we received one bid, we um, took some time to really reevaluate the whole process. Um, and ultimately, the outcome of that reevaluation, as many of you know, was that we ultimately recommended to City Council that we should reject the bid that we received. Um, and City Council did reject that at their May 14th uh, Council meeting this year. So um, there was an email about this, but I did want to touch on, you know, if there's other questions, why the city did uh, reject the bid. 
Um, and really when we issued the notice of sale and we had it out there for a long amount of time, we really did not anticipate that we would receive multiple bids, uh, but we only got one bid. And so that really indicated that the process that we went through just wasn't competitive. Um, I will say it's not unique for us to just get one bid and then to turn around for construction projects and reject the bid and then reissue um, because we really want to try to generate that competition and get a better uh, price for the city and the, the taxpayers, of course. Um, so before recommending to city council that we wanted to reject the bid, the city leadership did um, a pretty good um, review of the process and the findings to inform the decision making. So uh, one of the things we did was we talked with developers who had expressed their interest in the bid, that had attended the site visits and so forth about why they didn't bid. Um, and then we talked with residents living on Western and Carlton and then residents of the Neighborhood Association leadership as well. So uh, specifically, some of the feedback that we heard from the developers that had attended one of the site visits or had followed up and asked questions about the bid um, was that they didn't want to buy all nine houses that were for sale. Um, and they, they asked if we would consider selling them individually. They said it was really difficult for some of the smaller developers that were maybe interested in doing this work to be able to handle all nine together. Um, because the, the site the site is challenging with the flood risk there and with the development regulations in place. So it's, it's, they said it was challenging. Um, they also said that just the, the time frame to do the due diligence, the two back-to-back -back site visits wasn't enough time. And so they felt like they needed more time to go out and, and look at those properties and visit them and bring in their experts to help inform uh, what their bid would be on those on those properties. Um, there was also some concern about just the flood risk and the potential impact that it would have on um, selling the redeveloped properties. <clears throat> okay, so this map here uh, is just kind of a reminder of, of the properties on Western and Carlton. So there were um, nine properties that we advertised for sale last time. The two properties in the green hatching here, these are the two that we acquired with FEMA grant funds. Um, everything out there has been demolished and now it, it's green space that we're maintaining. Um, and then the storm drain pipe and the inlets are shown in black on this map as well as the flood risk. So I think this is a pretty familiar map. We've shown it many times, but um, so now I wanted to talk about 2213 Western. So when the city re-looked at the overall redevelopment plan and reconsidered the feedback from the community and the residents living on Western and Carlton, we decided at that time that we wanted to go ahead and keep 2213 Western and convert it to green space versus selling it for redevelopment. So as you see here, this is the property that sits right between the two um, FEMA properties. And so it just made more sense to acquire that, um, the plan is to demolish the, uh, the structure out there and make this green space again. So we would have one contiguous green space. So this is easier for the city to maintain, um, easier for us to, uh, to go in and have those open sight lines. The plan is to add irrigation to this site. We already have irrigation at the other two FEMA sites. Um, so it'll be irrigated and this way too, um, the community can have one contiguous green space if they want to use it for gathering. Um, I've been told really the main uses of the two sites right now are just for people to kind of go out there and walk or take their dogs out there. Um, so this way, it'll just be easier for both the city and the community to maintain. You don't have these two random gap properties um, with a house between them. So that's the plan uh, moving forward. I will say there's been... Um, a discussion of uh, talking about dogs, if there's an interest from the community in having like a pet waste station there, um, that could be something that is added. The plan isn't to, to go and add a lot of facilities or anything like that, um, but maybe something very basic. Hold on, my computer wants to restart. Okay. Um, and then just kind of a reminder in terms of our mowing, we do mow around every seven to 10 days from April to November during the growing season. And that's of course, weather dependent. Um, 
but if there's any um, questions or concerns ever regarding the maintenance, please reach out to the stormwater team since we do maintain these sites and we want to uh, maintain them at a high standard, knowing that they're surrounded by um, by homeowners and residents out there. Um, I will say too um, is, is I think we're always open if the the neighbors in this area want to potentially utilize those, uh, you know, for some kind of community purposes. Um, or, you know, potentially to help maintain them. We could do some kind of agreement with, you know, the, the neighborhood association or residents. Um, so we're open to having those discussions sometime in the future. Um, I will say that the FEMA regulations will guide what could be done on the two FEMA uh, acquired properties out there. Okay, so um, let's see. So the plan here is that we would actually start a demolition and site restoration for 2213 in Western in July. So the historic mitigation photography for the house that was a requirement um, has already been done. And as was done for the other two properties, and here's the other two, what they look like, uh, the, the two female ones that have already been de demolished in green space. So the other one will look similar to this. Um, so the other two properties before they were demolished, um, we had Habitat for Humanity come out and salvage from those sites right beforehand um, to keep those usable things out of the landfill. Um, and then, of course, they can resell those to help make money to, um, to help provide more affordable housing for the residents in Fort Worth. And so council approved um, that for this site as well. So that's the plan. And that was actually feedback from uh, one of the residents in the Arlington Heights area. I, I don't, we talked to so many, um, so I don't remember who, but that was a, an idea that we looked into and, and I think it was pretty successful for the first two. So we wanted to do it here. Um, we're also going to be removing, there's two trees that are hackberry trees in yellow um, at the same time that they're, we're out there to minimize disturbance. So we don't have to go out there again is to take those two trees down. We had the city forester out recently looking at our trees and he said that due to the health of these two trees, um, they were going to become a hazard and that we needed to go ahead and just take those down. So that's the plan. Um, just didn't want anybody to be surprised. The plan is to, to keep um, these other trees on the site when the homes are um, demolished, just unless there's some kind of issue during the, the de demolition process. Okay, so with that in mind, then um, initially we had tried, we were going to sell the 9 properties. So now we're down to um, selling 8 properties for redevelopment. Um, and as council member Hill said earlier, the plan is to sell these actually individually. So last time we required all of the properties to be sold together. Um, here, we want to sell them individually. Um, and, um, I say the, the buyers will still have the option just like last time as they can keep the, the existing house out there and elevate it at least two feet over the 100 year flood risk, um, or they can demolish um, the home and build a new home two feet above the 100 year flood risk. Um, so something different uh, about this time around though, is that we are going to allow buyers to actually uh, demolish the structures that are out there. And if they would like, they could leave it as green space for a while. So across the city, people have open vacant lots. Um, and so that's just allowed. And so we wanted to allow that here. And that was actually feedback that we received from some of the residents as well that we met with is, well, could someone just buy it and keep it green space and then redevelop it sometime in the future? Um, so that made total sense. So we wanted to allow that opportunity here as well. So our plan is to utilize a broker to help to sell these properties. Um, so we plan to list them uh, for 90 days to allow enough time for due diligence. The advantage of using a broker as well is that broker will have the authority to take interested buyers out there so they can have more time to do the due diligence. So it's not having just specific um, site days that are allowed, but they'll be coordinating with the broker to have access to to the properties. Um, so we really hope that this will um, generate some more interest in the sites. So the broker will help us determine the listing price. Um, and um, let's see. And yeah, and ultimately we just, we feel like that this will help us generate more offers on, uh, on each property. So 
when we are using a broker now, we have to follow section 253014 of the Texas Local Government Code. Um, so as a part of that, I just wanted to share these requirements. Uh, so here it says they have to be um, sold or advertised at least for 30 days on a multiple listing service. So as I said in the prior slide, we're gonna list them for 90 days. So we really wanna give uh, people who are interested time to go and do that due diligence so they can make an informed offer on these properties. Um, and so also the properties must be sold um, to the ready, willing and able buyer who submits the highest cash offer. So I wanna, focus on this a little bit because if y'all were around last year for the last time, uh, we had a scoring process where based off community feedback, there was an interest more in having elevated structures. And so we were going to score all of the bids we received um, and give extra points to those who were going to elevate the existing home. Uh, but if we use a broker, it is a legal requirement for the city um, is that we don't score anymore, we have to accept the highest cash offer. So I just wanna to touch on that. Um, we've also had some questions from community members about, well, if I live you know, near these properties, could I have the first right to purchase the properties? Um, and, and we found out from legal that's not possible. Jess, I see your hand. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to clarify one thing. If we accept an offer, it's required to be that highest cash offer. It does not mean that the city absolutely has to accept an offer coming in. So the city council still has the right to make that final decision. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Jennifer, um, I, don't to, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> uh, if there's a, a button to do that, but um, can you do two clarifying comments for me? One, are we using a residential broker? Or are we using a commercial broker? And then two, when you say cash offer, that does not um, preclude a developer to come in, have financing or a private equity fund to be able to come in and purchase these properties, correct? Yeah, that's my understanding. I think it's it's more the offer. I think that's just what it says in the, the code. Um, is Ricky, are you on the call? Can you clarify that? I don't I'm think pretty... he is, but I, I agree. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah, and then Jennifer, do you want to answer the question about the broker? Yes, and I have slides on the broker, so I was going to jump to that. Um, so in terms of the broker, so what we're going to do is we are going to issue a voluntary request for qualifications to select the broker. Um, and I'll and I'll say in reality, I don't, I don't know if it's like the residential or the commercial, um, but we can get uh, the feedback on that afterwards. I think Ricky's son had like a swim runoff race tonight, so he couldn't make it. Um, and so we wanted to do this so we could generate more broker interest and we could really um, ask, ask for questions that were relevant to these specific sites. Um, and then the plan is to have city staff members to evaluate uh, these requests for qualifications to help select um, the most appropriate broker to help us sell these properties. So, um, so they'll be asked uh, specifically, of course, they've got to provide um, that they're licensed to do this. Um, they've got to give us their sample marketing campaign to show how they would sell these. Um, they have to show that they're, you know, that they've sold homes in the Tarrant County area and have references, um, provide their fee structure. And then we've got some more specific questions. Um, you know, are they familiar with actually selling city, you know, municipal property, um, you know, state laws, making sure that we have someone who is an expert um, on helping cities sell property? Um, how would they actually establish the minimum selling price for each individual property? So in the past, y'all, um, many of y'all might remember that we had appraisals done. Um, so in this case, the broker, that's their expertise. So they will help us set that minimum uh, selling price for these properties. Um, and then do they have experience selling flood prone properties or with elevation of existing residential structures? Um, and then also experience working with guidelines to preserve historic homes. Um, so we'll be using these questions um, and then uh, we've got a, a slide to kind of say how we'll actually select them. So the city plans to have three staff members to review all of these um, voluntary requests for qualification. So we'll have a metric sheet. So each, each question will first kind of be a yes or no question. There's not gonna be a value for that. 
Um, but then we will also give each question a 1 to 10 ranking. So 1 being. Um, you know, the, the lowest rate by the answer or 10 being yes, like, this is, this is exactly what we're looking for. They answered the question. Well, they knew what they're doing. Um, and so the outcome of that then is that the recommendation from the city group. Uh, we'll take that to city management and recommend who we use and get get feedback before we move forward. <laughs> so, in terms of uh, time frames to redevelop, so um, right now we are going to this is something new um, is require buyers to actually demo the garages over there's two garages at 2216 and 2220 that are built over the storm drain pipe. Um, and so one of the new requirements of this uh, sale process is that we're gonna require them, whoever purchases, purchases those to demolish uh, the structure. Since they're on top of the storm drain pipe, it just makes it more difficult to maintain the pipe. It's a higher risk to the pipe. Um, and then one of the other require, well, I guess it, it during the um, the last notice of sale that during the question and comment period, there were a lot of questions about this back garage and accessory dwelling unit at 2300 Carlton down here. And so um, after we got more feedback from the team, um, we've added that that the buyer of this would have to elevate this back here. This is a um, ha habitable structure. Um, someone could also take the garage and extend it and make it more livable back here. And this is just so flood prone. Um, and so that's going to have the same requirements in terms of elevation as all of the other homes. Um, this exhibit is a new exhibit. We haven't shown this before. Um, in the last notice of sale, we had written into it that whoever purchased the properties would have to give us a 30 foot easement. That's a standard drainage easement over the size of storm drain pipe. Um, but we ha had not <clears throat> officially, <clears throat> sorry, we had not officially mapped that easement because the developer was also going to be able to relocate or realign the drainage pipe if they so desired. Uh, but now because we're gonna be selling to the individual buyers, we wanted to um, have all of the easement documents mapped up front to make it very clear where that easement was and to help in terms of each individual buyer's development plannings. It helps reduce the risk for them. It makes it more clear where that easement is. Uh, so that's what is showing here on the map is the 30 foot drainage easement. Um, in terms of the existing homes, if someone decides to purchase uh, like this site right here and you see the house is within the easement, um, they will be allowed to uh, stay in the easement, but new infrastructure, like a new structure, is going to have to be built outside. Um, the city does have a standard easement process that will follow, uh, so potentially there might be opportunities for waivers depending on uh, what the interested homeowner is using, and we'll follow the typical city process. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else. So on this slide too, um, the very same as the last notice of sale as that whoever buys these properties, if they want to elevate their existing home, um, they will have four years to elevate it. Um, and we did that because we didn't want to have just this vacant home sitting there and become vandalized or squatter ends up there. Um, and so we wanted either, we wanted them to take action. So they've got four years to elevate the existing home or two years to demolish it and convert it back to green space. And again, there's no time requirement um, for that to be redeveloped if it's converted to green space. Okay, uh, I think I've covered a lot of these. So this is the same requirements um, as, as last time. So just a reminder is that um, each new livable structure has to be two feet above the 100 year flood elevation, which is the same requirement across the city in flood prone areas. Um, they can't aggravate flood risk to other properties and they have to be built in accordance with the prevailing architectural style and residential nature of the historic community. Um, so stormwater review, these are very similar um, to last time as well, but I wanted just to, to put these in there as a reminder. 
Um, we will be doing or requiring pre development meetings for each individual resident. And this is an opportunity for whoever that buyer is in the city to all make sure that we're on the same page to help make that redevelopment process successful. Uh, because it, it, this is a little bit different. So they'll be required to provide a concept or a site plan and a lot grading plan that we'll review and approve. Um, because the, the properties are highly uh, flood prone, um, we wanna make sure that, that the risk to area properties is mitigated. So they're gonna have to have some kind of engineering evaluation to show that that redevelopment is not gonna increase flood risk. Um, they'll have to have a completed city flood risk area certificate. They're going to have to um, look at the lot grading before and afterwards to make sure that the lot grading is not significantly changing. So suddenly it doesn't push water onto um, an adjacent property that wasn't getting that extra flow before. Um, and that kind of goes along with just mimicking the existing site conditions um, and overland flow characteristics of the stormwater runoff as well as any additional impervious cover to that development footprint will have to be mitigated. <clears throat> and then once, uh, once these properties are redeveloped, um, the requirements will be released with the exception um, of these, these four things that will remain in the deed. And that is we'll always want uh, those future structures that are livable to be built at least two feet above the 100 year flood elevation, um, They'll have to maintain existing or very similar type of fencing in a similar type of location and alignment, uh, which helps to maintain the stormwater flow characteristics going through that area, uh, maintain existing lot grading, and then to provide a flood risk notice to future buyers and renters. So I think it's going to be pretty clear that something's different because these are going to be built higher up. But we just don't want future buyers and renters to be surprised when they move into these properties because they're still going to flood. It's just the houses will be built up higher out of the risk. Uh, but the, the yards will still flood, the landscaping um, will be impacted, people's cars and so forth. So we just don't want people to be surprised. <clears throat> We've got our um, kind of our architectural design guidelines. These are the very same as before as last time. So again, these are all gonna be single family. They can't be replatted. Um, again, the existing duplex on Western, uh, if it's elevated, it can remain a duplex and be and grandfathered, but if it's torn down, it will have to be built as a new single family residence. Um, observing setbacks, uh, really having con construction consistent with the adjacent structures, just so there's the harmony of the new and the old structures, and then placing garages and carports at the back of the properties versus the front, as, um, as historically was done in this part of the neighborhood. So all of these are just a reminder of the same uh, requirements as last time. So this slide shows the timeline of um, starting in July. So our plan is to uh, take those eight questions. I think we had eight or nine questions I shared earlier and actually advertise for the broker. Um, and then, as I said, to start the um, salvage demo and re restoration of 2213 Western in July. So advertise for the broker for around a month, select that broker, do all of the evaluation scoring in, in August. And then uh, end of August, or early September, we would be listing the property. Uh, for 90 days to provide that time, uh, ample time for due diligence site visits and so forth. Um, so then that would close kind of end of November, early December, where we would then determine who the buyers are, again, with the, the highest offer on each individual property. Um, and then those would go to council to approve and sell. So just like just said earlier, um, is that ultimately city council will have to um, authorize the selling of each of those properties. Um, and so potentially, you know, we might decide that we don't like an offer or something, um, but, but we will have that opportunity to look at everything, take them to council. And then it typically takes one to two months after council to go through the closing process. Um, so we're looking at March, April timeframe to actually close on those properties. So with that, um, I will take any questions or discussion and here is a link to our website that have the past meeting recordings and, and PowerPoints. And so our plan is 
within the next few days to get this recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation put on this website as well. And when it's posted, um, I will send out another email out there to let everybody know that it's available. So any questions? Hi, Jennifer. Um, do you have the legal verbiage for what the restrictions on the dot on the lots actually will be? Right now it seems they're it's up for interpretation. So can you share or point us to where we could actually find um, the legal descriptions of what these restrictions are? I've heard that you can only build on 50% of the lot, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then my next question would also be, should these lots or structures not hit the minimum bid? Do you have plan B? Okay, so in terms of legal restrictions, I mean, I could provide city development guidelines. I mean, so it's it's basically city code that they'll be required to comply with as well as our, our higher development standards that are documented in our development guidelines. And so when we issue um, the letter to advertise for the broker, we'll have the full set of development guidelines, just like we did with the okay. notice of sale. And so we'll have that. Um, as well as city code. So I can provide a link to city code, but it's it's pretty extensive. So um, in terms of plan B, um, I mean, fingers crossed that we sell these. Like we really do wanna sell these. We wanted to sell them last time. <laughs> um, and so I'm just gonna say right now is, is I, I mean, I feel pretty confident that we're bringing this broker on and based off the feedback that we got from the, the interested developers in the past, I really do think that we're gonna get some bids this time around. Okay, yeah, no, that sounds great. I'm, I understand you have to talk to the broker about this, but is there any indication on maybe what the dollar range, I mean, these, these are at-risk properties, um, so kind of what discount they will be taken compared to a market property that is not in a flood zone? Yeah, or is that I'm just really, still up for interpretation at this point? Yeah, I would say that that is part of the broker. And, and as you saw earlier, that's kind of one of those questions is like, how do they think they're going to market these? And how, how what do they think mm -hmm. that the minimum price is going to be to sell? And so we're going to rely yeah, exactly. on the broker for their expertise. Okay. And if I could just weigh in, I mean, one thought is I would hope at a minimum that we would get at least land value for the area. That may not be the case. I think Jennifer's exactly right. Um, we're really going to rely on those brokers to do the analysis, understanding that there's a lot of work that has to go into these properties. Yeah, absolutely. That's where my head's at. Any other questions? Jennifer, you've got one Jim, question in the chat. Want... Oh, there you go. <laughs> Jim Bureland had a question about the easement with what's 30 or 35 feet and whether or not it's centered on the storm drain. I believe the easement width was proposed at 30 feet and I, we've got Mike on the call. He might be able to remind me whether or not it's centered on the storm drain or offset. It, it is centered on, it's centered. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and that was the standard easement size for the size of storm drain pipe that is out there in the field. Any other questions? Y'all are just ready to get off. Jennifer, I think oh. you did a great job of covering this. I, th I think Carrie, I see it. Yes, Carrie. Hi, of course. Hi, Jennifer. Um, hi, Carrie. So, hi, guys. So, thank you for for hosting this meeting for us. Um, if these properties are sold, if it turns out that the what they're sold at is a a, a hugely discounted price, that there then impacts our property values. Um, would the city help at all with maybe trying to get a reduction on our taxes or anything? Because I mean, going, I know it's a different group. It's the tax appraisal district there. It's totally different, but I've talked to them about the fact that the area floods and I've had flooding and we all have had flooding and they just, they don't care. So I'm wondering if you guys would help us with that situation if that were to occur. Jennifer, I, think, uh, well, I was going to jump in real quick on that. Carrie, thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a really important um, point you make. But uh, my hope is, and as we walk through this process, when we sell the properties, that's not going to be the final value of the property. 
you know, once they're redeveloped, um, the, the goal is we want to make sure that whoever purchases the properties, and this is, I think it's going to be a multiple years in the making. So whatever the properties end up selling at is not going to be the final value. Hopefully someone will purchase it, either demolish the home, build a new one, redevelop it. But I think the point of this exercise is to really make sure that we're enhancing Arlington Heights and not doing any, anything detrimental that'll hurt your property values or the neighborhood itself. And I think that's, that's part of the reason why we went this route. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, um, okay. and in terms of the, the, ta the tax value, we just, we don't have control over the appraisal district. Um, so, yeah, we do get asked that question um, a lot, but um, yeah, I know we can provide information to residents for residents to use, but, but that is something uh, that's outside of our, our jurisdiction. Well, I'm just thinking, hopefully, if any of us want to sell, you know, in the interim, you know, between the period where the property is purchased for $10 and like <laughs> when it's developed to be worth something comparable to our values, I'm hoping that it wouldn't be, these would not be looked at as comparable properties that reduce our, our values. That's right. I just don't know what's going to happen. I hope that isn't the case, but. Mm. Okay, I saw some questions. I also have a few questions from Wiley Phillips. Okay. He's asking initially, is it a closed, sealed bid? And why would the city reject the bid? So yeah, so they will be they will be closed. So when people people will make the bids, they'll give them to the brokers and they will be sealed. So it's they won't like the other people who are making those offers won't be able to see each other's bids. So so they are sealed. Um, and what was the second part, Stephen? Why would the city reject the bid? Why would we reject? So, I mean, potentially just like the last one, like maybe we just receive one bid for each property. Um, I really, really hoping that doesn't happen um, given how we've uh, totally changed how we're going to market these moving forward. But that could be one reason is, is again, maybe someone just, we don't get enough bids. Um, and so we want to rethink things again. So the big thing is we're really trying to think of what is best for the community as well as uh, watching in terms of city taxpayers and trying to get the money back, um, some of the money back that we have spent on these properties. Wiley is also asking who will monitor the developers along the process and down the road? What if they redevelop and then build a new garage and extension in 2008? No, good question. So, um, so each of these uh, properties, when they go through the development process, that will go through City of Fort Worth Development Services. So they'll go through the typical development process. They'll have to get their permits. Um, and so the biggest thing is they'll have these additional development regulations. We've shared these with development services. They're aware that these are out there. They'll have them flagged in their system. Um, so they're followed. And in the future, um, this is uh, in one of our city identified non FEMA city flood risk areas. And so developments will have to get permits in the future to make sure that um, like new new um, if someone wants to build like a garage or a new extension or something going off the back of their house, they'll have to get permits and then follow city processes to make sure that those new developments uh, themselves don't flood and that they don't go push off water onto their neighbors. Um, so we're really trying to improve our flood risk uh, communication um, in these areas and, and better protect residents living in these areas um, to mitigate the risk of this happening in the future. And Jennifer, that's the brand new ordinance, right? That your team has worked for several years on and council just adopted. Yes, yes. So on addition. June 11th, yeah, and we've had some discussions in the past too. Uh, so on June 11th, city council did adopt um, updates to our uh, floodplain ordinance, our grading permit ordinance, and our stormwater criteria manual. Um, and part of those um, updates uh, will be to regulate um, less than one acre developments in these um, non FEMA city flood risk areas. Uh, so, for reasons like Arlington Heights, uh, we know these areas are highly flood prone. We've got lots of engineering data behind it, and we just want to make sure that as these areas continue to be redeveloped in the future, that both the 
the residents doing the redevelopment as, the, as well as the neighbors are better protected from flood risks. And then Wiley's last question is, or if they resell to a new person in 2030, will they know they can't make changes to the footprint? And I think your point there about the CFAs um, mostly answers that question, but we also have, after the initial development activity occurs, there are several deed restrictions that will remain the deed records to ensure these properties are developed um, in a way that protects them from flooding and does not impact the neighbors. Thank you, Stephen. And that's it in the chat. Oh, no, we've got oh. a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see Carrie's. Is there, is there still no hope the city will fix the problem? Uh, so not at this time. It is just a very, very expensive problem to fix. Um, it really requires conveyance improvements all the way down to the river. So we're not pushing the flooding to another part of the community. Um, or, you know, buy out more detention and that's just something that we don't want to do. Uh, so what this project did is we bought out uh, those most flood prone repetitive uh, properties that had flooded or were very, very low elevation at flood risk. Um, so we feel like that what we have done with this buyout and now with the redevelopment process is really protecting those residents that were most at risk of flooding and now allowing the redevelopment um, to, to fill those gaps in the community and keep the community connectivity. And I didn't catch the other question and disappeared and I don't know how to see uh, it. Monica um, is asking, if I'm looking at this easement map correctly, it appears that 2205 Western would not be able to have a new build on it since the easement extends to the middle of the property. 2224 Carlton looks like it might be in a similar situation. <clears throat> So, uh, so when I got this easement map, I actually asked the same question. I was like, wow, that looks really narrow. So we looked at the development regulations in terms of, um, you know, how narrow a lot could be for redevelopment and we checked with development services as well. And there was no red flags in terms of these can't be redeveloped. And, and Mike, do you want to touch on that? I think you were some of the ones that did that review. I did, and basically, it's it will be a narrower house. The good news is, or something interesting, I think it's twenty two twenty, is the house north of twenty two twenty four, is basically the footprint that that house does fit on there. It's a little bit hard to see here. Uh, the there's a I think there's a garage or something that's covered, but the building itself, um, there is enough room. It's basically okay. So it's you know, take the thirty feet divided by two. So that's fifteen feet right there on the south side of twenty two twenty four. That's what it takes up, and then you've got to keep a five foot easement on the other side. It's a fifty foot lot, so you're you're. I think it was a thirty to thirty five foot uh, building footprint. So we did look at it in detail because yes, yes, we had that same concern. It's like, does that really fit? But um, now the twenty two twenty is an example of a, a building pad that would fit on that area. Thank you, Mike. Now, and and we do acknowledge that because of those restrictions, that we'll probably get lower bids potentially on some of these properties just because there's a little bit less buildable space. Um, but this is too, uh, you know, in terms of our city, um, we have our city standard processes where we do look at our easements, um, and potentially there might be opportunities to get waivers depending on what it is. Um, so it would be a something that we would work with the future buyer follow the typical city process. So maybe not, um, but we're definitely open to, to talking about those options. And Jennifer, I think you told me earlier though, if somebody buys the existing home and just chooses to elevate that, we will allow that to yes. stay and facilitate yes. that to happen as well. Yes, yeah, and that's um, that's always been in uh, the the last version of the development requirements as well. Um, is yeah, obviously, if if they take that existing home and they just elevate it in place, um, that they they can remain in uh, in the easement. Uh, it's just really that new infrastructure, the new buildings that we want to be built outside of the easement. Any final questions? 
Um, so if you think of something afterwards, my email is down here at the bottom. So definitely feel free to email me back. Um, try to email me back by next Friday, just so we can keep your feedback in mind as we continue to move forward. Um, because again, um, in July, we really do want to move forward and, and, and start to uh, procure a broker. So we're, we're ready to get rolling forward. We're sure that y'all are too. Okay, right. thank you all for attending tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.